Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Maria, and I'm a very grateful member of Al-Anon. I am so honored to be here. Uh, I was telling my guest, who was so welcomed and invited to, to, to be here as well, Catherine, who flew in from Arizona, um, I said, I think we're the only people here with under 50 years. <laughs> I mean, this is a really, this is a really big deal here. So I'm just really honored. I want to thank Steve for asking me. I want to thank the committee. It's been amazing. Every We've had different hosts every single night. We've had more food that I, I, I might have to join another program after this week. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I do want to, to mention our, our, our thank you so much, Lori, very much for, um, for introducing me. I, um, as we were talking, I said, well, you know, I had no idea that we were going to go to Colorado and basically meet the state of Texas. And I said, you know, my sponsor's from Texas, so I feel very much at home. And she said, oh, really, where? And I said, Wiley. And she said, well, what's her name? And I said, Dottie. And she said, Dottie's my al sister. And I said, oh, my God, you're my al aunt. <laughs> and Catherine said, you're my al great aunt. So um, it's really, really cool. And my grand sponsor, her regular meeting is the Unity Group. And so it's just so, it's so bizarre. Um, I have been able to be at Sterling's meeting and have heard him many times throughout my program and loved being with him. I've heard Harold a couple of times and got to spend time with him at Mountain High in California. And Doug was taught drama by my uncle <laughs> in high school. <laughs> So if he had any drama in his story, it's my uncle's fault. (laughs) And Carla, Doug's stunning, model-esque, beautiful wife, um, sponsors the same woman that I sponsor, but she sponsors her in AA, and I sponsor her in Al-Anon. And then I got here, and they said, oh, look, Uh, we were at a restaurant, and I heard somebody say from another table, oh, look, there's Jerry Jones. And I've heard about Jerry Jones my whole recovery. (laughs) You know, and I'm like, wow, we're in a random restaurant, and there's Jerry Jones. I mean, it was like, and then we got to have dinner with Jerry and Billy and hang out with them, and it's just, it's it's just, this program really is a small world, and it's it's a small world and a huge family. And uh, whether you came from a great family that you're bonded with or you came from a family that maybe you're not too bonded with, um, it, there's still enough room for this family. Um, I was so excited to hear that we were going to be away for a whole week, you know, with a bunch of alcoholics in a place really far away with not a lot of transportation. You know, we're trapped here. And that's like an al idea of an open bar. And... Um, <laughs> And then I heard about altitude sickness and found out that you guys, one of, any one of you could just pass out at any moment and need to be revived, you know, and you need resuscitation. And I, so I brought my Florence Nightingale outfit just in case. And um, it just, I, I was, I, to, be, to be a whole week, to spend a whole week with program people is absolutely an amazing, amazing gift. So thank you very much. Um, I came into this wonderful fellowship uh, on April 13th, 1985, and it literally saved my life, and I hope I stay forever grateful for that. Uh, I don't want to ever take that for granted. Um, As I said, my sponsor's name is Dottie and my home group, just so you know that I have a sponsor, a recovery date, and a home group. My home group is the Stepped Up Group in Westchester, California, by the LAX airport. So if you're ever by the airport on a Thursday night, Um, give central office a call. We'll be happy to come and scoop you up and get you and take you to the meeting. It's about um, a little over 100 people every week. It can be bigger on um, birthday nights. And um, we celebrate birthday nights Texas style. So all the all the sponsors get up and talk about their sponsees, and then the sponsee gets up and tells their version of the story, <laughs> and um, and the whole night's birthday night. But the rest of the time we study the steps and the traditions, and um, and everybody shares because we split into five different rooms. So it's an amazing meeting, and um, it was started by my friend Vinoy uh, when she lived in L.A., and uh, it's just, uh, that's, that's, that's my 
that's, that's my program, and that's where I get my program. I was raised um, by some other sponsors as well, but every sponsor I've had in this program um, has taught me. They grew up in the program when they were studying the big book, like Billy was talking about the other day in, in the workshop. They didn't have Allen on literature back then. So um, we were taught to do the four-column inventory as laid out in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we study the steps in the AA 12 and 12 as well as the Allen on literature, which is wonderful. And I love the Allen on literature. But I love seeing where my program came from and that uh, my program was so generously given to us by Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's just, it's, it's just amazing. Um, I, uh, I grew up in Los Angeles. I grew up in the, um, when I was little, I was in the San Fernando Valley. And um, I didn't know I was from an alcoholic home. I didn't know that I was from an alcoholic home till probably a few years into the program. Excuse me. Just a little nervous still. Mm-hmm. And um, when I was uh, five, my my father was in television, and he created a TV show that in the 1960s kind of became the the uh, social conscience of the country. And it was very big, and it was a very big deal. And, you know, everybody was, you know, dressing in their 60s, you know, wear and, and, and uh, going to Andy Warhol's uh, – uh, club called the Factory, and it, you know, it was ba, ba, da, 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 da. you know, everybody was just the 60s out, and and um, we moved to Beverly Hills, and um, swimming pools, movie stars, and um, and um, I met my first him when I was six, and his name was Patrick, and um, his his older brother and mom were stars of the Partridge Family, and I just thought that was so cool, and. Um, we used to play tag on the on the um, playground, and he would chase me. It's the last time anyone's ever chased me. <laughs> and um, and he would run really cool because he'd stick out his upper teeth and then curl his hands around like little scoopers, and he'd go. <laughs> and then when he'd get close to me and he was just about to tag me, he'd say, "Come on, baby, let my fire." <laughs> And we used to go in my mom's coat closet, and he'd start at one end, and I'd start at the other end, and we had this day glow cream, and we used to put dots on our face, and we'd start one end to the other, and then we'd find each other through the coats, and then, (laughs) and kiss each other, and it was the greatest feeling in the world, and I have pursued that to the gates of insanity or death. It was so innocent and great and fun and not weird (laughs) and just that childlike innocence that, you know, thank God we all still have that white piece of velvet that Vinoy talks about, you know, that is inside that's never going to be tarnished um, based on the actions that we've taken because I took a lot of bad actions throughout um, my life due to alcoholism and due to my defects of character. Around that age, I always had one best, I started with one best friend, and I continued that pattern through the rest of my life for the most part till I got in the program, and basically my defect of control was already in full bloom. I really liked the reading that was read, and I identified with most of it, except for the one line that said um, our disease was caused by uh, contact with alcoholics, and that, that is probably true for that writer of that particular um, paragraph, and that's not my case. My disease is my disease and was caused by little old me, and it's not pretty. Um, but um, anyway, so I, um, I would control my best friend until she didn't do what she wanted me, to, what I wanted her to do, and then I would stop being friends with her, and I would move on to another friend. And that was a pattern I carried into adulthood, embarrassingly enough. You have to do what I want to do and do it in the way that I want to do it. And... Um, that doesn't usually win friends and influence people. And um, I, as I got older, I went to school. I was an okay kid, but my, you know, okay student. I had, you know, good life, good family life. Didn't want for anything. Um, very, very blessed financially. Um, everything. My dad is the most loving dad in the world. He's the most amazing man. He's my hero. I'm his biggest fan. He's my biggest fan, and I absolutely adore him. And um, he was also quite a. a, a uh, an admired person in, in his world, as well as um, just doing good things in society. And I admire him for that. And he's charitable and he's a good, good man with a good heart. Um, my mom didn't get the mom gene. She didn't get it from her mom. Her mom was very um, critical of her. She called her dumb and stupid till a few weeks before she died. 
And um, my mom was not loved because her she was born out of wedlock to her mother. And her mother, at the, especially back in those days, that was a shameful thing. And so she resented my mother for having to raise her and be a single mother and work in a factory to take care of her. And eventually she married well and was able to go on with her own life, but never really forgave my mother for being her. And so my mom didn't know how to be a mom. And um, later in the program, um, Actually, my mom shared with me in a um, in a therapy session that she took me to, which I had a suspicion something else was going on, um, and I found out that it was actually she was taking me to this therapy session because she was trying to do an intervention to get me out of Al-Anon. <laughs> and in that therapy session, two things happened. My mom proved to me that, well, yes, I was crazy, but I wasn't crazy about the thing that I thought I was crazy about because she admitted in the therapy session that she had never felt love for or from any human being in her life besides my father. And I always knew that my mother didn't love me, but hearing it, although it felt like an ax slicing me in half and having both sides of my body fall on either side of where I used to be, there was another part that thought, oh, thank God. I thought I was feeling something weird. I thought I was making this up. I thought I was crazy. The other thing that happened in that therapy session was after the doctor heard our stories, he said, well, I'd just like to let you know that I have, I think he said, 42 years of sobriety. (laughs) And I was the guy that um, testified against the captain of the Exxon Valdez in the court case. So I'm kind of known as a sober alcoholic. So he called my mother by name. You may have picked the wrong doctor to get your daughter out of (laughs) Al-Anon. We never had to go back. It was amazing. (laughs) But anyway, I had this really loving father. And, you know, God always sends people to stand in the gap. And I had this amazing father who who is so loving and so over, you know, joyed to, to see me and my sister and everything else. Anyway, I don't know. Anyway, so um, I'm going to skip up ahead. When I was uh, 19 years old, I was, um, I decided I was going to go out. I don't know why I thought I was going to do this. I was going to go out and I was going to pick up a guy. And, um, you know, again, I had no, I was not that great in school. I was not bad in school. I was a B minus student. And that's only because I had a good memory. So I could remember everything the teacher said and I didn't have to study. And, uh, I went out to, uh, this club and I was underage, but I went to this bar and there was a band playing and there was, you know, I was checking all the guys out and, you know, the lead singer, he was already talking to a girl who was in the audience and everybody else. I'm looking at them and they just didn't seem that interesting, you know, and then there was this keyboard player. And he was sitting at the keyboards, and his head was lolling back and forth, and his face was like really, really white, and there was red around his eyes. And um, I thought, that's the guy for me. (laughs) And uh, so I went up to him after the thing, and I tried to pick him up. And I said, can I buy you a drink? I was trying to be really sophisticated. I wasn't even old enough to drink, and I'm in a bar trying to buy this guy a drink. And he said, I don't drink. And I saw the eyes and the face and the this and the that. And I thought, well, you know, what's wrong with this guy? You know, and I said, oh, well, do you smoke weed? I mean, what's your deal? Nope, I don't do that either. Uh, Twenty-five days ago, I smashed my truck into the front of the Bank of America on Lancashire. And I'm afraid the car, and I ran away, and I'm afraid the cops are going to find me. So I joined Alcoholics Anonymous (laughs) so I can be sober by the time they find me. And my, you know, keen mind, of course, all the al in the room know how smart we are, right? I thought, he doesn't have a car. He needs me. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, thus began our three-and-a-half-year one-night stand. And he was going to the Radford Group in the Valley in California. And uh, Alabama Carruthers was there and, um, and all these long timers. And I would go to these AA meetings with him and I would sit in those meetings and I would just weep. I just love them. I love the laughter. I love the tears. I loved alcoholics saying, 
you know, uh, last year I was taking my cake and my wife was sitting on that side of the room and I was sitting on this side of the room. And now here we are. She's up here with me with our brand new baby. And this is what the program gives us. And they gave me hope and it was unconditional love. And it was just amazing. It was so beautiful. And I had goosebumps every time I went and I just loved, I fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous immediately. And then we would go home and he wasn't an alcoholic to me because I called him my boyfriend. And any time I put the word my in front of somebody, they're in trouble because my control is going to come in and my need to be right and my self-righteousness and my dominance and my I'm going to fix you until you can get well enough to fix me starts to kick in. <laughs> I'm going to be your mommy long enough for you to turn around and be my daddy. <laughs> Who's your daddy? And... Um, <laughs> Um, so the more dominating and controlling and emasculating I got to this poor man who was just trying to stay sober who I was laughing at all the alcoholics telling the stories in the AA meetings but he could tell me stories and I wouldn't laugh I would purposely not laugh even if I thought it was funny because I had that passive aggressive I had that that passive aggressive behavior at that at that age was already well formed I had vengeance I'm going to get mad I'm not going to get mad. I'm going to get even. And then I'm going to get even with you over and over and over again. And then I'm going to make you prove that you love me. Because I have such low self-worth and such emptiness inside. You know, I'm the victim. i got to blame you. And I'm the victim. And I'm irresponsible. I don't take responsibility for my own actions. That I'm pushing you away. So now I've pushed you away. You're running away. You know, joining the witness protection program. <laughs> I'm dusting for prints, you know, and, um, and now I'm blaming you for not loving me. And now you're the bad guy. And now every time you try to do something kind for me, I say, yeah, but you didn't do this. Yeah, but last week this happened. Who could possibly live with someone like that? Who could possibly stay newly sober with somebody like that? I didn't know anything about sobriety. I didn't know anything about supporting sobriety. I didn't know anything about practicing the traditions in a relationship. I wasn't in the program. And the more he asked me to go to Al-Anon, the only thing I had was being right. I had nothing left. I had no self-worth. I had no self-esteem. I had absolutely no assets left. I was just this dominating, controlling shrew. And the more I pushed him away, the more it proved to, to my deep insights that I was not lovable. And the more I pushed them away, the more I needed outside validation from other sources. And at that time, someone had lied about my age and got me a job as a network executive at ABC. And they told them that I was 25. And I was 19 when I interviewed for the job, and I was 20 when I started working there. And I was buying shows from Dick Clark and all the big TV producers and making multi-million dollar deals and had the big expense account, and I was 20 years old. And I didn't show them my driver's license when I first had to sign all the papers. I said, I forgot it, and I'll bring it back tomorrow. The whole time I worked there, I felt like a con because I knew it, that they didn't have my driver's license. And uh, I was working there, and at night I'd go to the clubs with him because I had to watch him because, don't you know, he's going to try to, get, he's going to, try to you know, hit on some other girl. This guy was just trying to stay sober. He didn't care about other girls. He was a really good man. And to the best of my knowledge, he is still sober today. Thank you, Lord, because it had nothing to do with me. Now, he tells a different story. He says that I was actually very helpful to him in his early sobriety, and I think he's being very kind. But, <laughs> but I was a nightmare. I was absolutely a nightmare. You know, I didn't have principles. I had my personality. And I had nothing saying we have, we have to place principles above my personality. I had nothing. I had no knowledge of practicing unity in the relationship. I had no knowledge that the only authority was a higher power and that it wasn't me. I had no, I had no idea that establishing a requirement for membership in our family group wasn't something that I was supposed to change every single day. Well, you did that, but now you have to do this. Well, you did that, but now you have to... I would just make jump through the hoop. Now I'm going to make it smaller. Jump through the hoop. Now I'm going to make it smaller. Jump through the hoop. Now I'm going to light it on fire. You know? That's a tough way for an alcoholic to live in a sober home. And I didn't know anything about supporting sobriety. If you're new here tonight and you're an Al-Anon... 
Al-Anon is a place where we learn to find ourselves and get our own recovery, not because we can we cause alcoholism or we can cure alcoholism or we can control alcoholism, but so we don't have to contribute to alcoholism. And there's a very big difference. Anyway, he was begging me to go to Al-Anon, begging me. He bought me a one-day-at-a-time book, and in the book it said, I thought it said, Dear Maria, happy 11th month anniversary. Please accept this as a gift of love. Love, Rick. What it really said was, Dear Maria, happy 11-month anniversary. Please accept this as a gift of love. (laughs) Love, Rick. He was so afraid. And I was so arrogant, smug, self-righteous, and dominating, like it says in our literature, that I had a table that had a, a navy blue top on it. So even just an hour's worth of dust, if you were shaking a comforter or something like that, could settle on the, on the blue and you could see. You could see the, the frame of anything that had been sitting on the table. And I was so arrogant and had such low self-worth that I had to cover with ego, because that's all I was, was just a big bag of ego, that I would pick up that book and I would lift up the One Day at a Time book and I would read a page and not crack the binding And then I would put it back where the dust mark was on the table so that he didn't know that I had read that book. And there was something in there. Because remember, I was in love with Alcoholics Anonymous already. And I had heard the message already. But I was just too arrogant to go get it myself right then. But that book was starting to change me. So I came up with a plan. And that was the plan. The plan was... I wasn't going to get too nice too quickly (laughs) because then he was going to notice how mean I was before. (laughs) So I was going to slowly but surely start applying what I was reading in this book, but I was going to do it in a really shrewd way. And he would always think that I was as wonderful as I was making myself out to be because that's another one of my defects of character. Superiority, inferiority. The worse I feel about myself, the better I have to act in front of you. So needless to say, because I was getting validation outside of that relationship at this big network job and having an affair with my boss's boss, which I'm not proud of, and that's just part of my story, and it's not the lady I am today. When I look back at that woman, I have no idea who she is, quite honestly. But it is part of my story. Because I broke all my principles. I was raised with principles in my family. I knew that having affairs with married people was not a good thing, and I did that. And as a result of seeking validation in other places, the other thing that happened to me was I got pregnant quite a few times. And I wound up terminating those pregnancies. And it talks about in in the promises in the big book that we will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. And I don't regret the past because I have had a lot of women come behind me who needed to hear that story. But if I could come close to regretting something... The fact that I am my age now and I used up all my e-tickets and I don't have children when I love them so much because of the actions that I chose, because I needed to have that validation, I needed to have that immediate fix, I needed to have that, that alcoholics talk about, that sense of ease and comfort that comes at once when I get that guy to look at me and, you know, t- stop talking about himself for just like 30 seconds. <laughs> And he says, honey, sometimes I love you so much I can't even see. (laughs) Now, usually he has, like, diarrhea from the bad hangover, and so he's really sick, and that's why he's saying it, but that'll hold me for three years. (laughs) Really. You know, give me crumbs. I'll take them. I'll take them. Because that's my addiction. Alcohol doesn't work for me. I feel less than. I feel empty inside. I feel most of the things that you hear about in Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. But alcohol doesn't work to make me feel better. I can't feel better when I drink. If I drink enough, I'll get drunk and I'll pass out, but I'll probably say, oh, I'm never going to drink that again, and I won't do it. It doesn't work. It doesn't fix me. It's not my oxygen. So I have to find somebody that I need to fix. Because if I go out with Mr. Cleaver, who leaves at 9 in the morning and comes home at 5 every night, I don't have a distraction from what's wrong with me. 
I have to pick somebody who's a, a work in progress so I can be the contractor and put them back together. And like Vinoy talks about, alcoholics are in full flight from reality, and I'm chasing right on after them. I'm just chasing right on after them, because if I ever chased somebody that stood still, I'd have to look at me. And don't you understand, that's too painful. It's too painful. It's too ugly. I had done too many things. Selling myself out as a woman when my little sister was born when I was seven. This thing took attention away from me. I did violence to my sister. I hated myself for that. You know, I lied, I cheated, I conned, I did a lot of stuff to try to make myself look better with people that had more money or the less money or whatever it was, trying to fit in doing all that stuff. And if I had to sit down and look at myself, it would be too much. I can't handle that by myself. You know, A, I'm Al-Anon and cannot manage my own life. B, absolutely no human power can relieve my Al-Anonism and see that God could and would if I seek him. I can't do it on my own. So it's too scary. I have to pick people who are running away. I found out something a few years into into program that I had no idea. I mean, you guys probably know this, but I didn't know this. Did you know that people who can handle intimacy and commitment don't stay in relationships with people who can't handle intimacy and commitment? <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> I don't care what the dance is. I just want somebody's arm up. Somebody's arm's always got to be up. The alcoholic's dance. Two steps forward, two steps back. And maybe my arm's going to be pushing you away because you're not the right guy for me or you're not the right friend for me or you're not the right whatever for me. But I prefer it when your arm's up because then I can be the victim and then I can blame and then I can be irresponsible, and it, I can make it all about you, and it's your fault. And one more time, I have that distraction. Alanonism, alcoholism, the family disease is a really ugly disease. It's a really, really ugly disease. I, um, I wound up breaking up with that man, that sober man, who was my angel basically into, into Al-Anon and I broke up with the married man at work and you know the other guy you know the team and um, <laughs> it takes a village and <laughs> and I wasn't bathing I was depressed I was uh, I quit my job I quit that big job in the expense account and I was depressed and I was dirty and my hair was dirty and I didn't brush my teeth and I only went out at night wearing sunglasses would only go to like save on and buy you know Oreos or something you know I'm in my early 20s and I'm living like this recluse um, and uh I didn't realize at the time, I look back on it later when I did inventory work, that I had already overdosed once by taking my dad's, I had found a jar of pills in my dad's medicine cabinet when I was a teenager in high school, and I took the whole jar. And by the grace of God, woke up uh, next to my own vomit and the toilet in my bathroom, and I cleaned it up and never told my parents and never said anything about it. And since I've been in the program, I've heard many stories of people who have asphyxiated um, by overdosing, and that was the grace of God. You know, he had a plan for me. You know, he knew, you know, there were styrofoam cups to be picked up at the Windsor Club in, Glen in Glendale, and um, I had work to do. And uh, so I, I didn't even remember that at the time. Uh, you know, denial is another, another one of my defects of character. And um, so I uh, was getting more and more depressed. I was alone. I was isolated. I wouldn't get out of bed, never got out of bed. And um, I stopped answering the phone. And one day I was feeling my ribs for where I was going to kill myself. I was going to go to the kitchen and get a knife. And I was deciding how I was going to stick the knife in and where I was going to stick the knife in. And I was deciding what I was going to wear. <laughs> and the reason, sounds funny, but the reason I was deciding what I was going to wear was because there was nothing in my closet that showed who I was. Everything was like a costume for different groups of people that I hung out with. And uh, I had heard that you can screw up slicing your wrists, and I didn't know how to do it, you know, the vertical, horizontal, too complicated, and all this stuff, and we didn't have the Internet. I couldn't just Google, you know, how do I slip my wrist? So, um, 
the phone rang, and for whatever reason that day I picked up the phone, and the um, and this girl called me, and she was the girlfriend of one of the other guys in in the band of my ex-boyfriend, and she said, and he she he was also an alcoholic. He was sobering up via the Valium method, which wasn't working too well, and certainly didn't work well for their relationship. And she called me, and she said. Maria, it's Becca. I'm going to kill myself. I need you to drive me to a mental institution. And, you know, if it were now, you know, I would say, really? I was going to kill myself, too. How are you going to do it? Let's go to lunch. You know, blah, blah, blah. Ha, ha, ha. You know, we'd have a good old laugh about it. It would be, you know, it would be like, awesome. High five, you know. And um, so, (coughs) but God did for me that day what what he's been doing for me ever since. And that was, I had no assets left. And, uh, you know, we've been hearing about, you know, God doesn't make too hard the terms to, for those who seek him. And I didn't have to go up, to, like you, everyone's heard those stories about, we don't have to go up to the top of the 50-story building to have God meet us up there. He'll meet us wherever we are. If we're down in the basement, he's going to come down and get us. You know, sometimes he'll fireman carry us up those stairs. Sometimes he'll just sit with us in the basement and hold our hand. You know, sometimes he'll help teach us how to walk and get our muscles going so we can walk up the stairs on our stairs on our own. But I had no assets left. I was absolutely empty, filthy, and a nothing. And I was in that bed depressed, and I could not function. And God didn't care. And he took the only thing he could work with, which were my defects of arrogance and pride and self-righteousness and need to know it all and need to be better than and need to be the expert. And I said, you don't need to go to a mental institution. You need to go to Al-Anon. I will call the office and we'll take you to a meeting. And we went to a meeting. (laughs) And that was the 13th of April, 1985. Thank you, God. And um, you know what? I fell in love with Al-Anon just like I fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I still was a liar. I still wanted to look good. I would come into the meetings when I was really new, and um, I would say something that just happened. Like, I wound up trying to get back together with that boyfriend for a few months. And, uh, you know, I'd come in and I'd say something like, yeah, you know, a long time ago this thing happened. Now, it had just happened five minutes before in the parking lot, but I wanted to, like, seem like, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm over that. I don't do that anymore. But I would get, people would give me pats on the back and say, thank you for being honest about that and sharing what you just did, you know, what you did. And that validation got me to be a little bit more current. And the next time I'd say a story of something I did and I'd say, yeah, a few days ago I did this. And then I was able to get more honest, and I'd come to the meeting and say, I knew I was coming to the meeting, and I was excited, but I was still really mean and controlling. And I did this, and I did this, and I did this. And those people loved me back to hell. On my very first meeting, there was a tiny little woman. I think it must have been on the third step. I have no idea what the meeting was about, but they must have been talking about God's will. And they were talking about, you know, whatever. I think it had to be the third step. And... um, at the end of the meeting, they leave time for newcomers. And they said, did the newcomers have anything that they want to share? And I raised my hand in my little arrogant way, you know, like, it's ten people and I'm waving like they can't see me, you know, oh, over here, over here. And, um, and they said yes. And I said, oh, yeah, I just want to say, you guys are talking about God's will this and God's will that. And, you know, if it's God's will, you're going to have a good day. And if it's not God's will, you're going to have a bad day. You know what? Maybe it's God's will that you have a bad day. Maybe God wants you to walk down the street and stub your toe so that next time you cross that path, you know not to stub your toe there again. And they said, thank you. Keep coming back. You know, and I was so puffed up. I really thought I stumped them. I really did. And this little woman, she's about this high, comes up to me after the meeting. She was 72 years old. She became my first sponsor. Her name was Ruth. And she looked up at me and she said, you know what, honey? It may be God's will that you stub your toe, but it's your will as to how long you feel the pain. (laughs) And I was like, whoa. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) It was like a flood just went over me and I was completely overwhelmed because I had absolutely no idea what she meant. (laughs) 
but I knew that it was really, really wise. <laughs> and I kept coming back. I went on through the program. I started working the steps. I, I changed sponsors um, after a few months, and I got another sponsor who I took my first inventory with, and I did my first fifth step. And in Palm Springs, she was renting a house there for a while, and, and, um, and I drove back through the desert in Palm Springs where they have all those little windmills, and they have those thousands and thousands of windmills. And I had heard all these alcoholics talk about, um, you know, that feeling of after you do your fifth step, it feels like the wind just blows clear through you, you know. And, um, and I was driving through the desert, and all those windmills were going, and it was like the wind was just blowing clear through me. You know, it was the greatest feeling in the world. I knew my sponsor knew everything about me and loved me anyway. And that was the greatest feeling in the world. And um, I always had a Polaroid with me. So I took a picture because, you know, al always need a camera with them just in case somebody's doing something guilty and you need proof and <laughs> doing something wrong. And, um, and I took a picture of those windmills in my rearview mirror. And so I had that picture on my, on my uh, sink for, for years until like the toothpaste and the water and everything made the Polaroid kind of try, you know, it finally split open. And then years later, um, girls I sponsor, they were coming through Palm Springs and they took a picture of that and they put it on a, on a frame with a plaque and everything. And it's, it's really neat. So I still have the, those windmills in my house. Anyway, um, I, I went on, I got another sponsor after that and, um, and I, I started working the steps in a different way. And I started working the steps through the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I started going through that, the, those steps and in each chapter and studying those chapters and seeing the promises in each chapter, not just in, in step nine. And I started seeing, started seeing the uh, prayers in each chapter. Um, and, uh, and then we got to the fourth step. And I got to see the four-column inventory and not just the four columns, but what's in between the four columns. When they talk about now we stop and we have to change our attitude in between the columns and we have to change and we have to say a prayer in between the colum columns and change our thinking about something in between the columns. There's a lot of work to do in between the columns. And I got to see that and I got to do that and start practicing and trying to, to practice these steps as outlined in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And... Um, I went on in my program, and one day I was somewhere, and I, I heard a speaker, and he was really funny, and um, he made me laugh, and um, so I m manipulated the guy that I was with to go hear him again, speak again, and then manipulated him. Um, Sterling was talking about that, you know, the hunter thinks they're the hunting, but they're really the hunted. And that's exactly what happened. He totally thought he was asking me for my number, and that is so not what happened. But um, <laughs> it took a lot of planning to get that to happen. So um, anyway, we were going to trudge the road to happy destiny in Alcoholics Anonymous, and, you know, he was going to be the AA, and I was going to be the Al-Anon, and I was going to sit in the audience, and I was going to laugh, and I was going to clap, and it was just going to be awesome. And... Um, and uh, he's a really good guy, and he's and he's a friend of mine, and I and he's he's uh, still long time sober and speaks everywhere today, and and a great guy. But the same thing started to happen in that relationship that happened out of the program. And when I was new, I was taught that everything that happens to you outside of the program most likely is going to happen to you in the program, in a different way. So because usually when I'm out of the program, I'm so numb and I'm so wired on adrenaline and that, that fuzz on that television screen is so high, everything has to be really high on the meter for me to feel it or understand it or see it. When that fuzz starts to come down and that static starts to get quiet in the program and we get serenity, certain lessons have to be seen clearly so that I can understand how to apply the principles of the program instead of my personality to those same issues. And what happened was I started to become his mom. And nobody likes to have anything more than a platonic relationship with their mother. Well, we've heard some, but <laughs> most likely, for the most part, that's not a popular idea. And um, <laughs> so... Um, the more that I felt rejected by him, the more I chased him, and the more I became his mother, and the more I started criticizing and complaining and emasculating and saying mean things and saying mean things in front of his friends and emasculating him in front of his sober AA friends. And the more I did that, of course, the more he pushed me away, and I became the victim. And because I was in the program, I had new tools to use, so I started using these tools in my old way 
forgetting the first tool has to be done perfectly. Step one is the only step we have to do perfectly. It's like being pregnant. You either is or you ain't, right? That's it. So I was not powerless. I skipped that step and thought, if I do enough inventories, if I do enough sex inventories six in a row, if I do... If I do enough prayer, if I talk to enough long timers about our relationship at every single convention and talk their ear off, you know, if I if I just keep talking about it, analyzing it, you know, I'm just going to do everything there is. I'm going to use all the tools like Louisville sluggers on this relationship to fix it because, dang it, I'm not powerless. I've got 24 principles now that I can use to really make it work. So we broke up. And, um, and, uh, and a few months later, he came back and he said, I want to try this again. And, um, you know, as we all know, if you are drinking spoiled milk and you put it in the refrigerator for three or four months, of course it's going to be good when you take it out. So, um, I said, sure, let's try it again. And so, um, We got back together, and we stayed together another 10 months. But this time, I got to do it differently. And I got to work the program, and I got to actually apply the principles of the program. And at this point, I had about, I would say, about seven and a half years. So I was right in the middle of my defects of character. They were just boom, 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 you know, just hitting me in the face, just uppercut, uppercut, you know, just. So, um, but that 10 months, I got to see my part in that relationship, And I got to do it differently. And in the end, I still decided that I wanted to break up again. But I got to see why I wanted to break up and that it was because of me and and what I need to do in my life. Um, Time went on. I got very ill. Um, At one point, I... um, a doctor said to me, I went to a doctor, uh, the doctor actually came up to me in a meeting. I was leading a meeting and she said, uh, I never mix my profession with meetings but um, you're really sick and you need to go to the doctor and um, you need to go tomorrow. And then she told everybody in the room so that they would make sure that I would go because that's the bummer about having a home group. They know everything. And um, so I went to home till I went to my doctor and the doctor said, you can drop dead at any moment. We need to take you into surgery right now across the street at Cedar Sinai. And I don't know about you, but when I hear somebody tell me that I could drop dead at any moment, my first thought is, I think I need a second opinion. And so <laughs> I picked up the phone and I called another doctor that I had at UCLA, and he, he said to me, don't do it. He said, you're, if that's the situation, you're too sick. You need to be treated first for a long time before we can remove your thyroid, fix your liver, everything else that was going on because I had um, hyperthyroidism and Graves' disease. So anyway, I wound up being treated for four or five years. I was really sick. The medication makes you makes it awful. It just makes it awful. It's just, trust me, you can't go anywhere in public, and it's just, it's ugly, and it's gross, and you don't want to hear about it. Anyway, um, I had surgery. I had, um, I was continuing my, my career, and something happened at that point in the program that um, a couple of things happened. I kept hearing these stories in Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon meetings that talked about people's people being able to practice the ninth step even after someone has passed. And I would listen to those stories and they would talk about going and reading the note at their father's gravesite or, you know, at the golf course because their dad liked to play golf or at the beach because their mom loved the beach or something like that. And then it dawned on me, my parents are still alive. So I realized (laughs) I didn't have to wait to that point. And because my mom, as I said, was kind of distant, um, we didn't have a regular relationship. We have a social relationship. My, 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 my work partner says, um, whenever he's referring to my mother, he always says, Hollywood kisses, Hollywood kisses. <laughs> so, <laughs> my mother will stiff arm you if you try to get too close. But um, anyway, so there was a new TV show coming on. And I had been taught early in the program, call my mom and ask questions about things she likes to talk about. Because if we're just expressions of our higher power, and my higher power came down to the basement to get me, it's not up to me when I'm going to try to make amends and living amends, and I've made direct amends, but when I'm trying to continue those and make living amends, it's not up to me to make sure that person meets me on my terms. I have to go meet them on their terms. 
So I would call my mom and I'd say, Mom, how do you make that stuffed flank steak? Now, I wasn't going to make the stuffed flank steak, but she knew I loved it. And she would tell me the recipe and she felt needed. And I would say, oh, let me ask you about this necklace I want to get. I didn't have the money to buy the necklace, but it was something she was interested in. So that had been going on. Well, I had heard this about this TV show that was going to be on the air. It was Peg Martin's favorite TV show, too. And um, we both had the same routine before it, goes, before it would go on every week. And I, and I heard it was going to be great. So I started telling my dad about it because it was kind of an Al-Anon manipulation, but in a good way. And Because uh, <laughs> I knew... Because I know it sounds odd, but seriously, my mom won't let anyone in the security gate that she doesn't want to have come in the security gate. So you got to get invited. It's like, you know, royal decree, right? So I told my dad about the show. And my dad said, well, that sounds really interesting. Why don't you come over for dinner next week and we'll all watch it together? And I said, great. So I got invited over for dinner, and I went over for dinner, and then, you know, we spent 45 minutes with them trying to figure out how to work the remotes, and then, <laughs> which was part of, became part of our weekly routine, and, um, and we would watch that TV show every week, and the lead character was named Jack Bauer, and, and every time Jack Bauer would do something heroic, I'd say, we love Jack Bauer, and my dad would say, we love Jack Bauer. And that was our tradition. And I got to spend time with my dad. And my mom would have a huge martini glass, like fishbowl, which martini glass full of vodka, like basically almost a full bottle of vodka. And she would carry it very carefully to the table in front of the TV because she didn't want to spill any of it. And then she'd kind of move her head over to that glass to try to sip out some of the top so she didn't, so she didn't, so she didn't lose any of it. And some days she was really nice and she was really funny back in her drinking when she used to get really funny and fun. And as the years progressed, the funny and fun part got less funny and fun and it got more to the meaner drinking part. And then it got to the exploding and storming out of the room part. But I noticed something in one of the traditions one time that said our, our primary purpose is one of, our, one of the things we do is our primary purpose is to try to understand and encourage our alcoholic relatives. And that was the first time it dawned on me, I have to try to understand and encourage my alcoholic relatives because it says it on the sign, not because she's doing it my way, not because she's acting the way I want her to act. So I got to go over every week and we would watch... And I'd say, we love Jack Bauer. And my dad would say, we love Jack Bauer. And one week, my mom exploded at the table because the alcohol just wasn't hitting her right. And she stormed away. And I didn't get invited back again. And then the show went off the air. And so I had to figure out a way, but it's coming back. And I told my dad. I had to figure out a way to spend time with my dad because my dad's getting older and I want to make sure that I see him because I don't want to have to write that letter. And uh, the other thing that happened during this period of time was um, my sister got cancer. And my sister and I had had a very tumultuous and jealous relationship when I was little, when she was little and when I was little, but I was seven years older than she was. So I had the upper hand. And uh, when my sister got older, she ran away from home. She was sent to a boarding school because she was so much trouble for my parents. And then my par- she, they brought her home to try to try her out at home, and I think she was home for about three weeks, and she couldn't take the constant criticism, and she ran away. I wasn't living at home at that time. I was already gone. She ran away, and they sent... Um, guards and private detectives and um and everybody after her and they you know they have everything at their disposal they have anything money can buy at their disposal and they hired security and they tracked her down and they hired a private plane and they made a really large donation to a mental institution and they took my sister away literally kicking and screaming and biting these security guards and they locked her up in a mental institution for a few years until she was 18 and could get out and um when she got out uh, her social worker said, you know what you need is Al-Anon. As it turned out, what she needed was Alcoholics Anonymous. My sister, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know, I don't ask, to the best of my knowledge, my sister has not had a drink since 1998. She did go to Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know that she still goes. 
um, but I don't ask, you know, and um, it's none of my business, but I know she doesn't drink. And um, in the meantime, I had asked, I, I talked to my sponsor about making amends to my sister. And my sponsor said, you should call her social worker because if she's in a mental institution, it may be too much for her to handle. And I called the social worker and the social worker said, no, she knows. She's going through the analysis of the adults, of the adult patients. You can come here. So I flew and, uh, and I sat down with my sister and I made amends with her. And the social worker said, you know, what is this? All I've been hearing from your parents, Maria, is how you were the cause of the problems in the family, how you didn't get along with your sister. Everybody's, you haven't come to any of the family groups because they didn't want you to come. They thought it was going to upset your sister too much. Now here you guys are sitting here talking together, you know, looking at the moccasin she made or whatever, and, and you know, and you guys are okay. And, and I looked at my sister, and, and I looked at her, and I said, I know. I said, you know what, I've, I've been in Al-Anon for... At this, when this happened, I had been in Al-Anon for about nine or 11 months. And I said, I've been in Al-Anon, I think, for 11 months. And uh, I said, and, and I realized that I never hated my sister. I just hated myself so much. I was afraid that there wasn't enough love to go around. And my sister said, well, I've been in analysis this whole time, and I discovered the same thing. So when we met each other, everything was just fine. And I was able to make direct amends to her. Well, years later... She winds up getting cancer, and she's lying there in the hospital, and she's she's on drugs, and um, and because she came out of surgery, and she looks up at the bed, and my parents had walked out of the room, and she looks up at the bed at me, and she says, Maria, I just want to tell you this, and it's not just because I'm on drugs, because <laughs> I'm going to remember it tomorrow. I need to make amends to you for being a really bad sister, and I said, No, AJ, you don't. You know, we're clean. We did that years ago. And she looked at me and she goes, no, you did that years ago. I didn't do it. And the next day when I came back to the hospital, she said, I want you to know, I do remember what I said. (laughs) (laughs) But that's the magnificence of these steps and why I love the fact that Bill Wilson separated steps eight and nine and six and seven because we get so many blessings in those getting ready steps, in those letting go steps, in those being coming willing steps, that I was willing to make amends to her as I was willing to make amends to a lot of people I couldn't find in the program. And I got the blessings. And later, God put people in my life. I would run into them in a different state when neither of us were from that state and I was only there for 12 hours. But I'd seriously just walk around a corner and smack my body into somebody. But I would get the relief from those things because I felt okay knowing I had practiced these principles instead of one more time living with my personality of I'm not going to lower myself to my sister. I'm not going to admit I did something wrong to my sister. So um, my sister wound up getting married. Uh, About a month before the wedding, her betrothed got in a fist fight with a cactus in the desert in Arizona. So he went to AA. The cactus took him, too. But um, so anyway, and I have the best brother-in-law in the world, and he's amazing. And my sister... Um, at her wedding had her best friend there who was her maid of honor, her matron of honor. And, um, and I was her maid of honor and she had, uh, she was there and I gave her a little gift in the bride's room and we stood there together, just the three of us, because my mom had kind of had an explosion and my sister had told this woman to escort my mother out of the bride's room and it was a bad scene and it was just, it was not a good, good, good thing that happened. And, and, uh, and my sister looked at me and she and, and looked at her, fr- her best friend, Shelly, and she said, this was my dream for my wedding. I'm marrying a man who I love so much, and here I am in my bride's room with my best friend and my sister, who's like the mother I never had. Which is weird to say when you have a mother, but I got it. <laughs> So, um, and again, my mom did the best that she could. You know, she really did. My mom gave me, my mom, the, the greatest thing my mom gave me was my love for reading. Because they say that 70% of all children in the United States have never seen their parent read a newspaper. 
I saw my mom read two newspapers a day, and every day I came home from school, I found out years later she made sure she was home when I came home from school. I didn't know that. And when she when she she would read her book on her side of the bed, and I would get on my dad's side of the bed, and I'd pull out my Nancy Drew book because I wanted to be a private detective or an Al-Anon, and <laughs> so I'd read my Nancy Drew books, and she'd take me to Hunter's Bookstore in Beverly Hills every time a new Nancy Drew book came out, and she'd buy me that book every single time a Nancy Drew book came out. There were so many things my mom did for me that her mother never did for her. So please don't get me wrong. She absolutely, my mom's still alive. I don't want to say she did the best she could. She's doing the best she can. She's a really sad alcoholic is what she is. She's a really sad alcoholic who was told that she was a piece of trash by her mom and by her stepdad and by a lot of people she grew up with. And that's all she knows because she doesn't have rooms of people like you guys. She doesn't have rooms of people loving on her and hugging her and telling her all that stuff. You know, she just doesn't. I had heard the story through Vinoy about Marcy White talking about the blessing and that everyone's born with the blessing when their parent looks at them and they just know and they're told and they feel it that no matter what you do, we love you no matter what and that you're lovable. And that if you don't get that blessing, that your job is to give that blessing back to your parent. When my grandmother was dying, I was able to go down with my mother to my grandmother's uh, retirement home, or the, uh, and then the hospital, um, and I was able to tell my mother over and over again how proud I was to watch what, is, what an example she was as a daughter with her mother and how lucky her mother was to have her as a daughter and what a great job she was doing. And I got to give my mom the blessing. She's had that blessing from my dad and she's had that blessing from me. And I don't know if she's had it from my sister, but that's all she's had because she doesn't have you guys. Anyway, um, I got really burned out doing TV. I had stopped that job, but I went back into production. As I said, my dad was in production. My mom used to be on TV, and um, I, I got really burnt out. And uh, one day, um, uh, this guy called me out of the blue, and he said, you know, I still remember this one joke you wrote for this one show, and I was wondering, could you write some stuff for me for an off-Broadway show? And um, it's I just need, like, political sketch comedy. And... Um, would you do it? And the first thing that went into my head, even with years of recovery, the first thing that went in my head was, how am I going to lie? How am I going to lie? I'm going to say yes, and then I'm going to say I went on Christmas vacation, and I came back later, and so I couldn't do it, and I started, I started building the lie. But I know that what you tell me to do here is to just to say yes. So I said yes, and he asked me for a couple, and I wound up sending him like 14 or 17 and after that happened, the show went on and all that happened. He called me back and he said, listen, I have the rights to this, this, broad, this, uh, this movie and I want to make it into a Broadway musical. And I really want to hire you because I think you'd be the best person to do it, especially because you're such a self-starter. And then I knew he had the wrong number. And um, I was like, are you kidding me? And I remember my old sponsor, Sue D., used to talk about when she was dealing with the Teamsters, um, that she would walk out in the hallway and she would call Elsa Chamberlain and she'd say, Elsa, these are big attorneys here. These are high-powered attorneys. And what do they know from, you know, I'm just oil field trash. I don't know how to deal. I don't know how to negotiate with these big-time lawyers. And Elsa would say to her, Sue, they don't know who you used to be. They only know the you that you that the program has made you into. And so I thought, no wonder this guy thinks I'm a self-starter because I'm, I'm just the me that this program that you guys made me into. And I wrote that show, and I called him 40 days later, and I said, okay, I have it. And he said, you have what? And I said, I have the show that you asked me to write, the script. Do you want me to fly to New York and read it to you? And he said, no, 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 no. You're supposed to be like everybody else, that I call them and ask them to do it, and then they say yes, and then I never hear from them for a few years. And then when I see them at a party, they avoid me. And I said, no, you asked me to do it, so I did it. So I went. This whole thing happened. At this time, I'm, I'm, I'm shaking in my boots a little in my program. My spirituality is a little shaky. And um, actually, it was Vinoy who said to me, you need to do the 12 steps again just on your relationship with God, that you are powerless over your old idea of God, and that your life is going to be unmanageable if you continue to hang on to your old ideas, and that you need to be restored to sanity with a new image of God. 
and on and on and on through the steps. And I just finished the first three steps and I was on a walk and this guy called me and he said, he was asking me about something else. And I said, you know what? I never did it. And when I looked at it, it just wasn't good. So I didn't want to send it to you. And he, he said, that's okay. I'm not doing movies anymore. I'm, I'm doing Broadway shows. I'm a producer of Broadway shows. And I said, really? Because I have a Broadway show. I just finished it. And he said, I'm coming to L.A. in three days. And he came to L.A. and I pitched it to him. And my writing partner said, there's no way he's going to take it. You know, producers, they promise and then they never call you back. And I said, but what's the ideal? I hang out with people that you set the goal, then you do the footwork and you leave the results up to something else. So just tell me, what is the goal? And he said, well, ideally, he's going to say he wants to produce it before he even walks out of the room. I pitched it to him. He stands up. He says, uh, I want to produce this show. So we got together a reading. He spent all this money on it. They bring all these people in. Everybody's loving it. All this da 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 da, all this stuff. We're going to go. The actors are saying, we've never seen anything move so fast. This has been unbelievable. And the guy died. <laughs> and when I first started working with him, he was sober. At the last few months before he died, I couldn't get a hold of him on the phone because he was always drunk. So my writing partner at that time says, okay, I have another musical. I want you to write this because this guy who's producing this show, he produced Phantom of the Opera and Cats and Jesus Christ Superstar. He did the album of Jesus Christ Superstar, all this stuff. And he wants this show to be his final, final show, his final big show because he's getting older and blah, 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 blah. So I want you to fly to New York and pretend like you're just walking by on the street. <laughs> and I'm going to just randomly introduce you. You're going to shake his hand, and then later I can say, you know, she would be perfect to write the book for this show. And uh, so I did. I did the full work. I flew to New York. I ran into the guy. I shook his hand. He flew back to London. I flew back home. And the next thing I know, I get a call from this guy. And he says, I want to, you know, you have to write a little bit for me to audition, but I'll pay you to write it and blah, 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 blah. I write it. They're going to have a big reading. They spent a workshop. They spent $300,000 on a produced workshop. Whole deal. Huge cast. Big stars. 300 people at a, at a workshop in an audience. I mean, unheard of. Usually readings are very small. Everything was great. The Schuberts are there. All the big theaters, you know, the Nederlanders are, oh, you finally got the book right. You finally got the book right. This is great. It works. This is wonderful. And he died. <laughs> so I heard Billy's story the other night and it made me laugh because I was thinking she's had a similar situation. Um, so, uh, I decided that I was just going to keep doing footwork and leaving it up to God. And as a result of that, I have been able to have these amazing experiences. And nothing is really coming to fruition. I got one show that um, premiered a couple of years ago in New York. It ran for a little while. Big producers didn't pick it up to move it on. But I got to have a great time. The morning that we went to our first uh, rehearsal there, my writing partner comes running down the street and he says, your people are there. Your people are there. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, at the theater, your people are there. I said, Glenn, what are you saying? He says, there's a sign on the door. Come here. Pulls me over to the door of the theater, and it says, Alan on meeting, 10 a.m. <laughs> so the first day of rehearsal of my show, I got to go to an Alan on meeting at 10 a.m. It's really pretty awesome. So, because a lot of the theaters are made from old churches and old buildings and stuff like that. And this was in an old church. So, um, anyway, did that, went on, went on, kept trying, kept trying. I'm almost done, don't worry. And uh, just last year I wrote uh, something else. And one more time, it was one of those footwork things. Just do the footwork. Probably nothing's going to come of it. But in this program, we just have to keep trying. It's not about, and what's really funny is my writing partner, who doesn't have a program and who's an atheist, he calls it pulling a Maria. And I keep saying, no, Glenn, it's Al-Anon. And he says, no, I, I pulled a Maria. I, this, I talked to this guy, and he said he was interested in my stuff, so I composed some stuff, and I gave it to him, and I just left the results up to whatever's supposed to happen. But I did the full work, and I'm just leaving the results. I pulled a total Maria. <laughs> I'm going to get him to a meeting one of these days. But anyway, um, anyway, so we just got that show picked up. And that happened about a month and a half ago. 
when I had already had this plan to come here. And um, the actor said, you know, can you be in New York on July 31st? And I said, no, I have a commitment, and I've had it for over two years. They asked me over two years ago. And he said, over two years ago? Who asked you to do what over two years ago? <laughs> it's a long story. He said it's kind of a spiritual, inspirational kind of, you know, thing. Wow, over two years ago. And... Um, <laughs> So anyway, I am leaving here to go to New York, and our show is going to open on August 9th at the Fringe Festival, and we're going to throw that one against the wall and see if it sticks. But in the meantime, because I'm busy in my meetings, on my board of my my conference, sponsoring people, being sponsored, taking the calls, making the calls, picking up the cups, setting up the chairs, cleaning up the chairs, and doing all that stuff... I could go to New York for that other show, and every day I showed up 45 minutes early, and I would help set up the tables and the chairs in the rehearsal room. And the guys, the stage managers, kept saying, no, 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 we're supposed to set that up for you. And I'd say, no, we're all going to set it up. And I would set up the tables and set up the chairs with the guys, and then I'd say, I'm going to go downstairs and get some coffee. What kind of coffee do you want? That's how I know how to do life today is practicing these principles to the best of my ability in all my affairs by placing the principles that you've so graciously taught me and placing them above my personality. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.